I believe it was Groucho Marx who said, Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. It's one of Lindsay's favorite puns. But apparently there's some flies in Egypt that like to eat on Egyptians. And that's what we're going to read about today. We've been talking about the plagues. And plague number one was the Nile being turned into blood. Plague number two was the infestation of frogs covering the land. Plague number three was gnats or mosquitoes all over. And all of those were lessons of, uh, there were signs of God's sovereignty over Egypt and over the Egyptian gods and over Pharaoh himself. So this mini-series is kind of titled Signs of Sovereignty. We've seen the Lord's sovereignty in Egypt. And we're going to see that again today in Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. Uh, a few more verses than last week. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there. That you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, or that I, the Lord, am in the land. Verse 23. Thus, I will put division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies in the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with you with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked, and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart, this time also, and did not let the people go. Our main idea, a little bit different, the same general principle, but just a little bit greater detail for today. The main idea is this. The Lord reigns and is present even in the heart of enemy territory. The Lord reigns and is present even in the heart of enemy territory. Now I've divided this passage for you so we can take it into manageable chunks and hopefully uh, there's some applications that will be relevant to you as we study this word. Let's pause and pray that God will speak to us in that manner from his word. Heavenly Father, again we come before you and we thank you for your word and the power of it. And We know that when it is sent forth, it does not return void. So we claim that promise today asking that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts, let no distraction, um, either physical or mental, emotional, um, be with us today. May we hear exactly what you want us to do. 
to, to know and, and be today. Speak through me. May even my mannerisms and my rehearsal, everything that I do today, uh, help us all to focus on your word and its truth. In Jesus' name, amen. This first section I've just labeled, let my people go or else, let my people go or else, verses 20 through 23. And this is the, the first cycle of the plagues is complete. They're set up in cycles of three. And plague four starts a new cycle, which is evident by the fact that God instructs Moses to meet Pharaoh down by the water again, down by the Nile River, just like he did in plague number one. So so you can visualize Pharaoh coming down to the river, maybe to get some relaxing fishing in. You know, the Nile River has the Nile perch, which is one of the biggest freshwater fish in the world. And maybe that's what he was doing. That's what I would be doing. But he's walking down to the Nile, and there he sees, Fa or there he sees Moses, and it's like, oh no, not you again. And Moses is to give Pharaoh a warning, a warning at this time. He says, let my people go or else. Or else, swarms of flies, a full-blown infestation. And what kind of flies are we talking about? Uh, well, scholars have studied it for years in various conjectures, but the wording here doesn't indicate a specific species, but rather just swarms of various kind of biting and non-biting insects, flies. It's possible that uh, one of them was at least the fly Stomoxus calcitrans, uh, which you will forget and I will forget, but it was a carrier of anthrax, uh, which was probably the skin disease that we'll see in a few weeks with plague number six, um, that uh, God is using these flies to kind of sow a seed for a future plague. It's very possible. And I would remind you that these plagues are targeting the Egyptian gods. Uh, at least that's a very strong interpretation. Numbers 33 verse 4 says just that. When God showed his signs and wonders, it was displaying his sovereignty over um, the false Egyptian gods. So if that is the interpretation, um, it's what, which god are, are we talking about? Well, there's several. Uh, Shu or Isis I've mentioned before. There's actually a god that was associated with a, a fly, a house fly, uh, Uachit. But like I've said before, for Moses, who's writing this account, Yahweh's competition, Jehovah's competition, isn't even worth mentioning. Um, so God is sovereign over all, even over the flies in Egypt. But what's worth mentioning is the key detail of verse 22 and 23. And that is the distinction that God makes between Israel and Egypt. They are set apart. The distinction has been understood from the beginning of this um, narrative from the beginning of the plagues. But now Moses is making it clear and he does so as the plagues move forward. So Israel lives in Goshen uh, and it's a valley on the eastern Nile Delta. It's about five miles wide and I believe 30 miles or so long. And it was given by a previous Pharaoh to Joseph when Joseph was in the land doing his thing, saving Israel and saving Egypt. So it was a gift to Israel because of Joseph. So Israel is set apart geographically. They've been living there even though they're the slaves of Egypt. But Israel is also set apart religiously. Yahweh, Jehovah, calls Israel my people. But he distinguishes them from the Egyptians, even though they've been living there for centuries. Pharaoh's people, my people. So they're set apart ethnically, they're set apart um, religiously, they're set apart geographically. But more important, here's the biggest distinction of all. The flies are going to ignore Israel and the land of Goshen, and they're only going to swarm in Egypt. Now, I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? in the natural world. Unless you're Pigpen, uh, Charlie Brown, you know, you get the focus of the flies, but nobody else does. No, that's not really how flies work. Flies attack and swarm everybody. But pay attention to the purpose clause that I highlighted in verse 22 when I was reading. He says that you may know that I am the 
in the midst of the earth or in the land. The Lord is going to say this phrase, use this phrase, uh, several more times in the plague narrative. And that's driving home the point of this whole thing. Again, the sovereignty of God, that the Lord is God above all gods. He, he alone is worthy of Israel's worship and allegiance. And that's kind of the mega theme, as God is showing himself greater than anything and anyone in Egypt. For Israel specifically, and for us individually as a spiritual Israel, we can make uh, an application here. This is worth writing down. The presence of the Lord will protect you. The presence of the Lord will protect you. The Lord says that he is in the midst of the earth. He is Lord in the land, even in enemy territory. He is Lord. Just like God was present with Israel, God is also present, uh, present in the life of the believer today. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 91, where it says in verse 1 that the one who lives in the, under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. And then the psalmist goes on <clears throat> to describe all these situations, whether it's plague or war, whatever it is, God is right there with you. Um, does that mean that we'll never suffer or experience failure or disappointment? Well, of course not. But I believe it was Justin Martyr who said, you can kill us, but you can't hurt us. Even in the midst of persecution, what's the worst thing the world thinks they can do to a Christian? Well, kill them. But killing a Christian only sends us directly into the presence of our Savior and Lord. You can kill us, but you can't hurt us. God has set apart his beloved children, and we have been distinguished from the world just like Israel, not because we deserve it, but because of his great love. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The presence of the Lord will protect you just like Israel. Believer, God is with you even in the midst of of enemy territory, even in the exile of illness or persecution or hardship. So Moses says from the Lord, thus I will put a division, Pharaoh, between my people and your people. And when is this going to occur? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Moses gives Pharaoh this message from God. Let my people go or else. Or else what? Great swarms of flies. Great swarms of flies. Verse 24, this next section. Great swarms of flies. It's kind of hard to say. Uh, great swarms of flies, Batman. Uh, flies in droves descend upon Egypt just like the Lord had threatened. And like the frog infestation, you could not escape them. There is no way. They were everywhere. Just imagine. The Egyptians couldn't eat without getting flies into their food and into their mouths. They were crawling in their ears and getting stuck in their hair. The flies were swarming around their eyes. They couldn't walk without smushing them underneath their feet. Their skin had welts from, from the fly bites. I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a horse fly, but that is not a pleasant experience. They couldn't sleep for all the deafening buzz of flies everywhere. You know, the ancient world, there were no screen doors or screen windows. So flies were everywhere. Actually, uh, Friday was International Woman's Day. And do you know who the inventor of the screen door was? Well, I didn't until I looked it up. Hannah Harger from Iowa in 1887 was a woman who invented the screen door. Amen. Praise for Hannah. We don't have to worry about that. And we also have bug spray today. Deep. Praise God for deep. I don't know who's in charge of deep. But anyway, Pharaoh is swarmed with flies. This has impacted him personally. Um, I was tempted to, to, to call this sermon, Waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Uh, because that is the situation. Or rather, there's some soup in my flies. They are invading the land so much that... It says that the, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. And that doesn't mean the ground, the earth. It's metaphorical for meaning the quality of life in Israel was decimated. That seems strange for us because it's just flies. But if you can imagine 
flies thick in the air. That's the idea. And there's a clear lesson here for all of us, especially in our modern culture. Write this one down as well. The Lord doesn't make idle threats. The Lord doesn't make idle threats. People don't fear the judgment or wrath of God much anymore. It's unpalatable to talk about God as anything but loving and compassionate and merciful. And God is certainly all those things. But the scriptures also give us full warnings about the punishment of the wicked and the impenitent. The Lord doesn't make idle threats. Think about this quote. Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who, who said that? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. I mean, you're not going to find that quote on a coffee mug in Hobby Lobby, are you? It's unpalatable for our ears. We need to remember, uh, we need to remember that the same Lord who sent the plague of flies will also slay every firstborn child in Egypt, not covered by the sacrificial blood. And that's so countercultural today. And, and if we're not careful, we can easily slip into a, a popular but unbiblical faith that is woefully out of balance with God's in regards to God's love. It's a faith that reduces the holiness and the justice of God, the holy and just God, to kind of a perpetually lenient grandpa God. You know, a God who might scold you, but then he's going to take you out for ice cream later to make sure your feelings weren't hurt. But that's not God. That's not the God of the scriptures. The Lord doesn't make idle threats. Uh, as a parent, I've learned one of the neatest tricks is this counting to three business. One, two, three. And I don't know what happens when you get to three. Um, I don't have anything planned for what happens when I get to three. But our kids change their minds somewhere between two and three. But that's somewhat of an idle threat. But the Lord doesn't make idle threats. He knows exactly what's going to happen when he gets to three. And we need to be aware of that. Moses is, is learning that by example, watching this happen to Pharaoh. Pharaoh and Egypt and the world are seeing this happen. And so we get down verses 25 through 28 and I've labeled this section, plead for me, plead for me. And this is Moses. Uh, there, I read a story about a little boy who was down in front in church and he was sitting and, and, and he was acting up and cutting up and, and um, just not being very good in church. And he kept getting the stare from his mom. And eventually, uh, when he wasn't changing his attitude and his behavior, mom came down and grabbed him by the ear and started dragging him back up the aisle and taking him outside. And of course, he's screaming all the way down the aisle, pray, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Well, that's, that's Pharaoh. That's Pharaoh. He's been caught. Pharaoh's resolve is beginning to waver. He's been very stubborn so far, but he's so miserable with these flies that he thinks it's time to bargain. He's not going to give in, but he wants to bargain. So he says, go sacrifice to your God. But notice the caveat, within the land, meaning the, the land of Egypt. Pharaoh's desperate for relief, but he's not so desperate that he's willing to part with all of his slave, slave labor just yet. So he says, okay, Moses, you all, you want your religious holiday, go ahead, but you got to stay in Egypt. you got to stay in Egypt. And Moses, actually using very diplomatic and culturally appropriate negotiation language, rejects the offer. Rejects the offer. Uh, for Israel, it's worship in the wilderness or bust. Uh, but here's his reasonable objections. He says first, in verse 26, he says, uh, you know, Pharaoh, the way we worship is offensive to you Egyptians. And that's just going to cause more problems. Israel were shepherds, and that was kind of an objectionable um, cultural position to the Egyptians. More likely, uh, the animals that God would require of them to sacrifice were considered sacred in Egypt. Much like you wouldn't go to, say, uh, parts of Asia today and mistreat cows because cows are seen as sacred, almost divine. Same kind of thing. 
So that's first. Our, our, uh, our worship is going to be offensive to you. But more importantly, verse 27, uh, Pharaoh, the Lord wants us to go into the wilderness to worship. Notice this phrase, as he tells us. Moses has learned that it's important to obey God fully, to do exactly what God says. Besides, Pharaoh knows that this really isn't a few days off for a holiday. God isn't asking for a three-day weekend for Israel. That phrase, three days journey, uh, you see there in the text, it's not to be taken with wooden literalism. Uh, I kind of saw it this way, just like Gilligan. You remember Gilligan's Island? Gilligan went on what? A three-hour tour, and, but he was indefinitely on the island, right? Well, this is a three days journey that's going to result in a permanent exodus. It's just kind of culturally appropriate, gentle language to say, we want to be free. So Moses rejects the offer, nothing less than full freedom. It's Mount Sinai to worship the Lord or bust. But Pharaoh wants to continue to bargain. So Pharaoh has a counter offer. And though we might not perceive it in our English translations, apparently he gets a little impolite, gets a little pompous, because remember, Pharaoh thinks he's a god. He says, I will let you go to worship in the wilderness, but you can't go very far. You can't go very far. That first person direct language is kind of rude. We wouldn't know that, but it's kind of rude. Uh, and you can kind of imagine him saying this now, depart from me and on your way, pray for me, plead for me. Pharaoh wants relief. This plague has probably affected him personally and he's getting frustrated, but he's still Lord of the manor or thinks he is. So he's starting to bend, but not break. And like the frogs, he wants Moses to pray for relief. So let's, let's stop this chunk of the narrative and make another application. Tucked in these verses is a concept that's going to be beginning to build as we go further into the Exodus. And it's this. You must be set apart to worship God properly. You must be set apart to worship God properly. What do I mean by that? Set apart, I mean holy. For our worship to be truly acceptable to God, we need to be holy, set apart from sin. The problem is, mankind, by nature, by choice, we're unholy. Israel's going to learn in the wilderness, when they are finally set free, that the Lord can't be worshipped just any old way. Moses knows that we must worship God, like verse 27 says, as he tells us. That's important. And again, this is countercultural in our society. Cultural Christianity teaches that God accepts everyone no matter what. That he's so desperate for worshipers that anything will do. You don't have to consecrate yourself. You don't have to be holy to worship God. You don't have to give God your best. Any old worship will do. Come late, leave early, come in your pajama pants, just like Walmart. It doesn't matter. But the Bible teaches that God desires worshipers that worship Him as He instructs, as He desires to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4. And of course, anyone is welcome in our worship. I'm not saying that people aren't welcome. They should feel welcome and they should feel safe. But for our worship to be acceptable to God, we must be holy. We must become holy. How can a sinful man worship a holy God? Just like Israel. Only through the shedding of blood. The shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Except that all the blood of bulls and goats and all of that was just a foreshadowing to Jesus, who was really our sacrificial lamb. Now most of us, perhaps even all of us today, are true believers. So we have been declared righteous by God. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. Uh, his final atonement has purchased our salvation. So God does receive our worship gladly. He sees us as holy in Christ when we, are, uh, when we believe and trust in Him with faith. But if you're here today and you haven't put personal faith in Jesus, uh, 
You need to know that, yes, you are welcome here to worship, but your worship isn't satisfactory to God without saving faith in Jesus Christ. You can't champion sin and worship God in the same breath. It doesn't work. You can't kind of sort of believe in God and worship Him on your terms, like the world likes to, whenever you feel it, however you feel it. Like Israel, that's a lesson we need to come back to, that you need to surrender your whole life to God. All of your life is a worship service to God. Moreover, we won't be welcome into the worship of heaven without that repentance and faith. We must be set apart through salvation and be forgiven of our sins, washed in the blood, in order to worship God properly and be received by Him. So that's a strong lesson we see here developing in the Exodus story. But Moses says, okay, I will plead with the Lord for you. Verses 29 and 30, another section back to the story. Pharaoh told Moses that Israel could go, but they mustn't go too far. And then he asked Moses to pray for him. Let's look at Moses' response. And remember that Pharaoh got a little impolite, a little pompous. And now Moses returns a favor. He drops that polite third-person bargaining language, negotiation language, and uses direct first-person dialogue. He says, Behold, I am going out from your presence, and I will plead with the Lord for the flies to depart tomorrow. Not today, <laughs> tomorrow. Again, this nuance isn't not always evident with our English translations, uh, and it's only by... Uh, strong study that I discovered it. Uh, I like what Old Testament scholar Walter Kaiser says. He describes it's kind of like this. Moses is saying to Pharaoh, don't you however me, Pharaoh. You're in no position to negotiate. I mean, you're the one covered with flies, dude. You know? But then Moses kind of backs off, reverts, reverts back to the third person, and kind of drops a, a courteous hint. Courteous suggestion. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go. Don't go to this. Don't renege. If you're going to do this, you really need to do it because this is serious business. So Moses goes out from the Lord's presence. And again, a display of Christ's likeness. He intercedes for his enemy. He prays for Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And, uh, but he won't yield. He will not yield to Pharaoh. And that's another lesson for us. Quickly, Christian, yield to the Lord, not the world. Yield to the Lord, not the world. It's hard for us to really appreciate, so far removed, how challenging this must have been for Moses. Egypt was the strongest nation in the world, and Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world. And Moses was offered a compromise, a legitimate compromise. Take a few days and worship, but stay in Egypt. It would have been very easy for Pharaoh or for, for uh, Moses to yield, but he didn't. He yielded to the Lord, and that's a good example for us to follow, especially practically in our lives. The pressures of our Western culture to compromise is very great, even for Christians. The serious Christian is often passed over in the promotions in his job or, or shunned or mocked in the break room. I've experienced it on occasion. Uh, other non-Christians take a different tack. They might not overtly persecute, but what they'll do is they'll, they'll tempt you as a believer because they know they want Christians to be like them so they don't feel as bad about their sin. They feel more comfortable in sin, so they make a temptation to compromise. So, you know, the gentleman, you're, you're on a business trip, and hey, what's the big deal? It's just one beer at a gentleman's club, gentleman's club, you know? Besides, think of all the good I could do if I got that promotion in the office. Who's going to know? Well, the word God knows... And eventually the world will find out. But yield to the Lord, not to the world. That's a great example that Moses gives us. So finally, Pharaoh again hardens his heart. Verses 31 and 32, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Two things stand out in these final verses. Number one, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That, that idea from James 
the book of James, the latter portion. Again, it's stunning to read both that Moses prayed for his enemy and prayed for Pharaoh and that God answered that prayer specifically and completely. Uh, the Lord did and as Moses asked. I mean, that's impressive to read. God favored Moses so much that he would answer such a bold prayer on behalf of his enemy. And notice, not one fly remained in Egypt. So even if this fly problem was somewhat of a natural phenomenon, a natural fly that occurred in Egypt, even though it was in, an, in abundance, I mean, who ever heard of flies surrounding one ethnic group of people and ignoring another ethnic group of people? And then they disappear at Moses' prayer. The Lord is showing that he is Lord even of the flies. He's Lord of the flies. The second thing that stands out for me is Pharaoh's unreliability. Again, as soon as relief comes, he reneges on his promise. He reneges. He goes back. He won't let Israel go. He hardened his heart this time also. And I know I've been pounding the drum of hardening your heart and being guarding your heart, so I'm not going to go there again. But I would like to bounce back to another lesson we saw in the second plague. Pharaoh gives us an example of what not to do. We don't want to be like Pharaoh. We want to be more like Moses. So speaking positively, here's the application. People of the word should be people of their word. Okay, People of the word should be people of their word. Christian, you need to honor your word. You need to have integrity. If you promise it, fulfill it. If it is at all possible. And if you have doubts, don't promise it. Like I've said before, under promise, over deliver. That's how you encourage others around you and be a good example. When you agree to serve, you need to carry through with the obligation as best as you can. I mean, illnesses aside, work situation, things like that are understood. But we need to be reliable. We need to be reliable in our work situations. We need to be reliable with our family situations. We need to be reliable in our church situations. All of life, we need to be people of our word. And when you blow it, fail, own up to it. Don't make excuses. Make a sincere and simple apology. And do better next time. That's, that's the standard I'm trying to hold myself to. Uh, and you should as well. I'm doing a chronological through the Bible reading plan. And it's interesting how sometimes these things converge on one another as you're studying. I came across Numbers 30 on Friday. The whole chapter is God instructing Israel how if you make a vow, that's important and you need to fulfill that vow. Here's the circumstances where you can get out of that vow, but you need to be people of your word. You're different from the rest of the world. You're different from the pagans. You need to be set apart even in your reliability. Maybe we shouldn't expect so much out of a pagan Egyptian king who thinks himself of, as a god. But we as God's people, people of the book, people of the word, should be people of their word. And I hope that's the standard you're living to as well. One closing illustration, and we'll bounce back to our main idea. I've heard this story before, perhaps you have as well, but it's a great reminder Missionary John Patton and his family were serving among Aborigines in the South Pacific. And he, at a missionary conference, recalled on one desperate occasion how the locals had surrounded the missionary compound, intending to burn it down with them inside of it. He and his family were surrounded and there was no way out. So there in the compound, they knelt in, in prayer, expecting to be incinerated and to meet their Lord. But when morning came, they discovered that the Aborigines had withdrawn. A year passes, and a year later, the chief of that tribe had been converted to Christianity. And John asked him about that night, what happened? And the chief said this, we were afraid to attack because of all those big men in shining clothes circling your house with drawn swords. We are afraid to attack because of all those big men in shining clothes circling your house with drawn swords. Church, the Lord reigns and is present even in the heart of enemy territory. I don't know what enemy territory is for you, 
Sometimes work environments can be a hostile environment. Sometimes, unfortunately, even family environments can be hostile to your Christianity. Or maybe your environment is an illness that you're struggling with. But we remember from this word that God is there. He is the Lord in the midst of the land. He is the Lord in the midst of our struggles, even in the heart of enemy territory.